I want to welcome everyone uh, here uh, joining us for the um, Robert A. Fox Executive in Residence for 2008, um, who is, uh, and that's uh, L. Wilton Agatstein, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. I'm Nicole Biggert, and I'm the dean, and I think I know most of the people who are in this room, so I'm really glad to see you. Um, but before I introduce our guests, I want to just uh, thank uh, my number of my colleagues um, uh, for for coming. Colleagues both at the Graduate School of Management and and from the administration. Um, we have a number of campus officials here: Barbara Horowitz, our provost; Bill Lacey, our vice provost of University Outreach and International Programs; Barry Klein, vice chancellor of research; Stan Nosek, vice chancellor of administration; and Bab Sandine, uh, who is vice. Chancellor Chancellor of University Relations. So thank you very much for coming out and joining us uh, this evening. Yeah. <clears throat> and thanks for mixing with our GSM community. Oh, and uh, also Dean Winston Coe uh, came, and I saw him, and uh, um, um, math and physical sciences. I also want to thank several of our uh, members of our business partner uh, program here. Business partners are our local businesses, our regional businesses who affiliate with our program, support us financially and uh, in other ways, emotionally too sometimes, um, hiring our students, coming to our programs, and uh, being real boosters for, for the Graduate School of Management. I want to thank you for, uh, for your support and for joining us tonight. And just a little bit of information, uh, uh, last, um, <clears throat> last month, U.S. News & World Report uh, ranked our MBA program among the top 50 in the country um, for the 13th consecutive year. Um, and that, that's important for two reasons. There are uh, uh, almost 600 accredited business schools and probably 10,000 unaccredited one, uh, ones. So being in the top 50 is a really good thing. It means we're in the top 7% of, of uh, accredited business schools. It's very good company to be in for a small, a small school. And I was at a, I was at a very um, highfalutin function last night in San Francisco, and uh, someone from, uh, from Harvard came up to me and said, you know, you have the most underrated business program on the West Coast. And I said, thank you. <laughs> so we have a good reputation, and I know it's, uh, they've heard about us uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the other coast. Um, the quality of our program is, ha, does a lot of things for us, certainly in the classroom, but it also allows us to attract really high quality um, uh, executives and faculty, certainly, um, to share their experiences with our MBA students. And our executive in residence program is one way in which we are able to bring people who have really special skills to our students in the classroom. And we're very grateful to Robert uh, A. Fox, uh, who led Foster Farms, he led uh, Revlon International, Del Monte, a whole range of consumer, um, major consumer uh, uh, goods uh, producers. And he endowed this program last year with a gift of $350,000. And the income of that is what allows us to, to invite an executive to, to be with us every year. Bob was a, is a member of my Dean's Advisory Council. Um, and he, he, he served in, as executive in residence in 2001. It was a great experience for him. He wanted it to go on, but he was a great experience for our students and, and actually has uh, maintained contact with a number of students, uh, mentoring them and advising them over the years. Um, his uh, his uh, generous gift really uh, extends the, this experience um, 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 in perpetuity. And so now I am here and glad to in introduce this year's Robert A. Fox Executive in Residence, uh, Will Agatstein. Will has nearly three decades of global experience and in the high-tech uh, uh, area. Uh, he's got a very deep understanding of, of uh, emerging markets and what it takes to sell in, in emerging markets where the infrastructure isn't all in place. Um, and this year he is, or this quarter, he's teaching a quarter-long program to our students that's focused on innovation for the developing world. He was at Intel for 27 years until the first of uh, uh, this year, and while he was there, he, uh, he established a, a, a track record for uh, innovation in, in a whole range of business, uh, business 
uh, processes. Um, he's He's now a, uh, a local resident, he's been working, uh, working out of Folsom, but working around the world. He's been in Folsom for 15 years um, uh, with the Emerging Markets Platform Group. He travels, uh, he travels frequently around the world, and I think you're going to see some pictures of his travels. And he really developed a passion for selling in places where it's very difficult to sell and where people really need the, the technologies that Intel produces. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a very special problem and a very special opportunity for, uh, for companies like Intel. He, he led teams that rolled out um, solutions in Cairo, Sao Paulo, Shanghai, and Bangalore. He's been everywhere. Um, and most recently, and I think you're going to talk about this tonight, um, you spearheaded the launch of Intel's Classmate PC, which is a low-cost, personalized laptop for children. Uh, in the developing world, and it is uh, one of the uh, one element of Intel's worldwide effort to improve education and to really to provide economic opportunities for for people who who uh, whose opportunities are very limited. He offers his expertise um, to turn ideas into action. That's the GSM's motto by helping organizations that are are trying to solve uh, some of the world's toughest problems. He serves on the board of. Um, Invineo.org, which is a social enterprise that is delivering technologies to people who are in some of the toughest places in the world, rural Africa, places with no electricity, uh, uh, no connectivity, and who are really often uh, parts of uh, displaced populations. Uh, he's, he's a senior advisor to the United Nations Global Alliance for Information and Communication Technologies and Development, and he advises several member organizations uh, such as uh, Grameen Solutions. And if you recall, um, uh, Mohammed Yunus, who formed Gr uh, Grameen Bank, uh, won the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. He's um, uh, a senior fellow at Winrock International, which is a global nonprofit um, that's affiliated with the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, it focuses on innovative approaches in agriculture in natural resources management, in clean energy, in leadership development. These are all things that people here at UC Davis care very deeply about. Um, and, and he links local individuals and communities with new ideas and technology through, through Winrock International. He uh, graduated uh, magna cum laude with a bachelor's of science degree in material science from Rice Uni University. He holds several patents for advances in voltage regulation for microprocessors uh, and integrated circuit packages. And he's an avid biker. Is he a, is he a Davis Aggie or what? Uh, <laughs> and he tells me that he's going to be riding in the Davis double century race on May 17th. Um, this is a 206 mile trek to Clear Lake and back. <laughs> Anybody want to come? <laughs> Some of them probably will be there. Um, his topic this evening is, um, pa is really about this passion that he has developed, and it is called Innovation in the Developing World. So please uh, help me in welcoming Will Agatstein. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dean Bigger. Does anybody not have an envelope? Uh, hey, Jess, would you do me a favor? If you do not have an envelope, I will. Oh, hey, Jess. So thank you for having me. Uh, this is our youngest daughter, Jessie, who is now handing the envelopes out. Um, so thank you for having me. This has been a, a great opportunity for me uh, to be able to join uh, the UC Davis uh, campus for this quarter. And it's been able to allow me to take my passion and in many ways be able to pass it on to others, provide opportunities to others, uh, and learn from others. And I know many of you have seen many PowerPoint presentations. I just want to warn you, this is the only slide with words on it. Uh, none of the other slides have words on it. Uh, if you look at the developing world, I mean, one of the things you can think about is we all think bad things about the developing world. But there is so much that we, as a world, can be proud about. First of all, we all live longer than our parents or our ancestors. In India, where this lady is, when I was born, the average age was 35. Uh, now the average age is 67. So that's a tremendous improvement that's happened in the world. The second thing is 
we all can be proud about how we all eat better around the world. A lot of that, of course, has to do with the work of UC Davis and others around the world. We all are nourished better. We all have much better health. Healthcare has improved around the world tremendously, which has allowed people to live longer, prosper more, and contribute more uh, to society. Uh, this is a depiction of what happens to health uh, in rural India. We all are better educated. Uh, education has changed tremendously. In uh, 1990, about 80% uh, of those children in the world receive primary education. Uh, this year, it's almost 90%. The goal is, of course, to reach 100%. And those of particular interest and particular focus, obviously, are girls. In Africa and other parts of the world, uh, girls are not as well educated as others. And more importantly, they don't go beyond elementary school. These girls who are in rural Turkey obviously are very happy and getting a great education. This is the work done by a lot of people. And while we think of the developing world, and we think of those in the developing world, we don't think of any progress has been made. And the, actually, the answer is completely different. A tremendous amount of progress has been made over the last 50 years. There's also tremendous progress in economy. Tremendous progress in small businesses and large businesses being a success. These are literally the books of a telecenter uh, in rural India. However, as we all know, there are a lot of things that you can deplore and a lot of things to correct. As we were talking about war-torn parts of the world, uh, this is rural Uganda. Uh, this is near Kampali uh, in Uganda, which is just torn by war and strife. There are 1.7 million internally displaced people just in Uganda. And there's 26 million around the world, which is the largest number it has ever been in the history of time. This is something that clearly we can all improve. As well as improvements in health care. Uh, if you look at around the world, some of the major issues have to do with health, with sanitation, and with that opportunity. And actually, one of the bigger ones, obviously, are the young. Uh, this little girl in rural Mexico uh, is sitting there. Um, and she actually represents one of the biggest problems that we have educating children around the world in the developing world, whether you're in the US or elsewhere. You ask any principal of any school anywhere in the developing world, whether they're in the developing world of the US, like Del Paso Heights, or the developing world elsewhere. As my wife, she's a principal. Uh, and they will tell you the exact same thing. Their number one problem, whether you're in Del Paso Heights, or whether you're in rural Mexico or India, is broken families. It is the number one problem. Mothers, generally it's mothers, taking care of the family. They cannot provide for their family. And most importantly, as a mother of this young girl, she had no hope. We actually were talking to her about what she had for her hopes and dreams for her children. She had no idea. She had literally had no idea what could happen uh, for her children. And then there, of course, is one of our class's favorites, sanitation and water. Uh, about 40% of the world does not drink clean water. Matter of fact, one of the students in our class came in last week. Her project's on clean water. She came in with like uh, a water bottle, took it out of a bag, shook it up. It was full of dirt. She said 40% of the world drinks water just like this. Uh, water is the leading cause of death around the world, drinking bad water. And clearly, this is something that can be improved upon. Uh, this is in Vietnam. This is outside of Hanoi. The other thing, obviously, is fuel. Uh, as my students will tell you, as my family will tell you better, I have hundreds, if not uh, thousands, of photos of propane tanks. Uh, <laughs> women carrying propane tanks, children carrying propane tanks, propane tanks on bicycles, just on, top, on the back of motor scooters. Uh, if you look at the energy around the world, it's not as efficiently carried as it could be. And we see this as a huge opportunity. 
The other one, obviously, is transportation. Uh, this is in rural India, which, by the way, you're on top of the bus because it costs half as much as to be in the bus. And so a lot of people will be on top of the bus. And it's interesting is that there's not much transportation. And what this actually leads to is lost opportunity. This is actually the bus that's coming into a town named Mandia. And the issue is the bus, uh, actually this is returning, comes in, goes out once a day to the main town, and comes in once a day from the main town. And if you want to do any amount of governmental work, any amount of form filling, any amount of getting loans, any amount of health or whatever, you've got to go to town. And it takes an entire day. It's not like, you know, running down to the local post office, because there isn't one in this town, or running down to the doctor's office, because there's not one, or running to the government. Uh, and running to the government in India, of course, is special because you can't just run once. Uh, you have to run a couple times. People in India have almost redefined line standing. Uh, and the average head of household in this town of Mandia spends 24 entire days a year on that bus out of town to go do paperwork to support his or her family. And that's 24 days that they could not be doing productive work. And most of the stuff literally is like you know, a five minute of effort once you're there. Uh, and if you could somehow make it simpler, fix these transportation problems, they could be more effective. The other one is uh, commerce, uh, transportation for commerce. Uh, this is actually in the uh, Aswan River near the Aswan Dam. And um, this is like a picture out of a storybook. I mean, uh, other than the, the hotels in the background, uh, which are being built and have been for as long as anybody could remember, uh, these guys are in this boat that you actually can't see from this picture. It has about two inches of freeboard uh, and is carrying concrete. Uh, and so they were going slow enough that we could circle around and go talk to them and, uh, and kept our distance in case that two inches of freeboard went away. Uh, and they are limited on their commercial capabilities because, merely because of their transportation. And so these are all things that are opportunities uh, for us to be improved. Uh, and the other thing is, if you look at the effort done uh, by most of those in the developed world, our world, and as the British would do, they would start by saying, no offense intended, right? And then they would offend you. Uh, <laughs> The developed world, the mature markets, we have literally littered the world. We have littered the world with our old stuff, our refurbished PCs that don't work. We have littered them with our old technology. And I would dare say in most of our efforts uh, to solve things around the world, uh, most projects that people have done have failed. And so the world is actually littered with failed developing world projects done by the mature markets. OK, time for the inclusion activity. Everybody grab your envelope, please, and don't open it yet. OK, now, the purpose of this exercise is to understand how big this market really is. In your envelope is either a quarter, a nickel, two pennies, or one penny. OK, so don't open it yet. If you have one penny in your envelope, you family make, your family makes less than a dollar a day. If you have two pennies in your envelope, your family makes between a dollar and two dollars a day, entire head of household. If you have a nickel, uh, the math's not exactly right, your family lives on $5,000 a year. And if you have a quarter, you are the rich people. Now here's a trivia question. Who is the richest person in the world? And you can't answer the question because we already had this question. Who is the richest person in the world? Anybody? Buffett. Sir? Buffett. Not Warren Buffett. Unfortunately, that's not the right answer. And it's not Bill Gates either? It's not somebody in India? It's a Mexican, that's right, Dave. Carlos Slim, who is the head of Telmex, is the richest person in the world. Uh, and so if you are the richest person in the world, you are not necessarily in the US, and you're not 
necessarily in immature markets. Okay, so now, everybody open your envelopes, please. And take your change out. It should be one penny, two pennies, a nickel, or a quarter. Okay. All right, everybody who has a quarter in their envelope, please stand up. Ooh, thank you. All right. To my extent of guessing how many people are in this room, that's about mathematically correct of the number of rich people in the world. And by the way, for the record, all of us in this room are a quarter person. Now, we all wish we were as rich as Carlos Slim, but we are a quarter person. Okay, now everybody who's got a nickel of what, I'm sorry, sir, you're not our target market. <laughs> everybody who's got a nickel in your envelope, please stand up. Holy cow. Family and friends are all the rich people. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, no, no sitting down yet. Got to stand up. <laughs> wow, Jesse. So if you, you are uh, a, you have a you're, your family earns about $5,000 a year, and you would classically be called a socioeconomic class C person, which is you went to high school, you finished, you might have started a little college, and you have a job, you have a motorcycle, but not a car. You have a TV, for sure. And you are part of our target market. OK, I'll sit down. Thank you. OK, everybody with two pennies in your envelope, please stand up. OK, so you, wow, this is a little weighted on this side of the room. You, you and your family earn about $2 a day. Uh, you don't, amazingly enough, on $2 a day, you're not starving. Uh, you eat well enough. You don't actually own your house. You probably just kind of squat somewhere. Um, but you live there permanently. Uh, your kids get an education. Um, you're actually doing OK. You are our target market. And if you all could please sit down. OK, now, everybody with one penny in your envelope, please stand up. OK, it's interesting. This kind of this little village here. Uh, <laughs> you and your family earn less than a dollar a day. Actually, with inflation, it's a dollar eight, but a dollar a day. Uh, you are always hungry. Uh, you probably, sorry, ladies, uh, half of you would be dead uh, from child from child labor. Uh, and uh, your mortality rate's very high, and you're always wanting. And there are about 980 million of you in the world. You are our target market. You all can sit down. So you can see, other than our favorite rich guy over there, everybody else in, in the world is part of our target market of the opportunities. Uh, if you earn you know, $5,000 a year, your actually life is pretty good. But it could be better in many ways. If you earn $2 a day, then you're not really wanting, but clearly you could have better opportunities. And there are about a billion people in the world who live on less than a dollar a day. They're always hungry. They're always wanting. They have no home. Uh, they have a very high mortality rate. And so far as I would say, the world is pretty well littered uh, with those kind of folks. Yes, sir? Can we keep the money? You may keep the money. <laughs> you may definitely keep the money. And that is why I use uh, change. One time I used dollars. <laughs> and I was out a lot of money. So you may definitely keep the change. Uh, so in any case, the question is, who are the people, who are the children in that part of the world, like this girl along the Nile in Egypt, who are they looking up to to help solve these problems? And the answer, obviously, you know to the end, will be us. Okay, so how did I get started doing all this? Um, I'll try and do the fast version of the story. Uh, but with Intel for 27 years, worked in the wafer fab, uh, started the design center uh, in Penang, Malaysia. And as I say, the fact that my wife stayed married to me during all that time is a credit to my wife. Uh, and then we moved here in Folsom uh, uh, in 92. And the very first project that we worked on, Tali, uh, is this kind of project called the Intel Overdrive Processor, if I can get this out. 
Uh, this is a product that actually we designed. It was my first really major innovation with our team to be able to upgrade computers. And it has some really neat features. Most of those patents you, you had are on this little chip. And we showed this to Andy Grove, who was president of the company. And he looked at me and said, you have a perverse view of the universe. We will never put a fan on any of our chips ever. And when the president of your company, and we all know Andy Grove, well, we know of Andy Grove, right? He's a legend. By the way, he's earned all of his legendness. <laughs> he's a very sharp guy. Says, you have a perverse view of the universe. We'll never do that. Um, you better be certain in your innovation uh, to go forward. Now, I have never bothered to go back to him and say, well, actually, we put about 500 million of them on. Uh, and every system you buy, every desktop, every server you buy today has got one of these in it. I've never gone back to tell him that. Uh, <laughs> but it was the first time where you learned a very valuable lesson, which is if you could do an innovation, you should research it. Uh, you should do a lot of work, and you should make sure you're right. And this, is a, this was the first time uh, we actually did that. And so during all these years, we grew this business. We learned all about the developing world. Of this business, which turned uh, from overdrive processors, which were upgrades, uh, for any of you who have ever built your own computer, I'm sure you recognize the individual box processor that we also created and innovated as a team. Uh, as now I'm at, uh, kind of hit the 300 million unit mark. Uh, it's Intel's single largest customer. And its main target is the developing world. And that's actually how we learned all about the developing world is by coming up with a product, solving a problem, and going and following what customers wanted and bringing them better solutions. It's also how I literally fell in love with doing innovation for the developing world is because when you go around the world, you meet with these computer manufacturers they're all individuals. They're all people who really are nickel kind of people who are running a business who want to be able to improve their lives and their children's lives and the lives of their employees. And they are no-nonsense kind of people. And they're the ones who can really help you improve what you're doing. And so we went out to develop products uniquely for the developing world uh, with a team of a lot of people, uh, including these people who are part of the team. This is a team building. Now, I want to point something out here in this picture. The thing I want to point out is all of us, Rice, MIT, Stanford grads, we're all on the front of the boat. The, actually, I noticed this when I put this picture in today. The people who are in the stern of the boat, the people who are setting the pace, the people who are really putting in motion how we do things, one's a graduate of Sac State, the other's a graduate of Davis. Uh, and I just noticed that when I put the picture in today. So you can see that the opportunity here for us to be able to really set the pace of what needs to be done uh, is available. And you can push all those Rice, MIT, and Stanford grads to the front of the boat. <laughs> so now we're going to go through quickly and do a couple imaginations. Now imagine you're in rural India. India is hot. It's 50 degrees centigrade. You go outside to cool off. India redefines the concept of dusty. Any concept of dusty you have out there in the fields in Davis, just forget it. India redefines the concept of dusty, and there's no electricity almost all the time. So I love to go stand out in the middle of the street and take a picture looking to the right, see what you look at. Picture four, see what you're looking at. Picture the other direction, what you're looking at, and then behind you. And what you see behind you is this information kiosk. This kiosk was one of our projects, this and many others, to bring information to the developing world. And in this kiosk, are two guys. Uh, the guy closest, furthest from you is the owner of the kiosk, and the one closest to you is his employee, the one who's running the system. And if you are a farmer, or a student, or a teacher, or an educator, or a person who generally is the house of ho head of household, who needs something done from that main city, you can go here, and they'll do it online. And I talked to the Sarpanch, who's essentially the mayor of the town, and he said, we believe this will make it so that you never have to go into town. There's 20, he said, that's about 24 more days every year that the head of households can stay in town and work. And this is a perfect example of the innovation that we did that has some very basic that allows people to improve their lives. And by the way, one of the things I'll mention 
is that this is a money-making venture. None of these things are charities. All these things are start, started off in believing that we can make money, the people along the way can make money, and the customers can make money. And as a little plug for the Graduate School of Management, one of the great things I've learned in all of this time is that a great idea doesn't do it. A great, a bit, great bit of research and a great you know, idea will not be successful, which is, by the way, why the world is littered with so many projects. Everybody along the way, from the original manufacturer to the eventual customer, has to have an econ economic benefit or it will not be successful. And it's one of the great things that I'm working with our students on is turning those ideas into reality. First you come up with an idea and then you figure out how to make it reality. Just an idea is not enough. Here's a list of services you can get everywhere from you know, birth and death certificates. My favorite is called the non-creamy layer certificate. Uh, so if you're milk, and what rises? The cream, right? And if you're not the cream, you're the non-creamy layer. <laughs> Therefore, you are the poor. And you can walk around with your non-creamy layer, and you can get government benefits. <laughs> Go figure. And then the other amazing thing you find is agriculture. I think most of you have followed the news. Actually, if you would ask me six months ago or a year ago, uh, you know, how much will agriculture really turn into some of the future, world's future problems? And I, would, I said, I would go, hey, water will be it first. Uh, of course, we, I'm now wrong. Uh, and we've now decided, you read it, any of the newspapers, food riots, price of food, uh, be, ability to buy rice or whatever is a huge problem. And you go back and look through your thousands of photos that I have, but that my friends and family have suffered through most of them. Uh, and you look and you find many, many, many photos of food being grown. Rural India, growing food. What you don't know is we're actually standing on the road. Food's dried on the road because it's the driest place. Uh, you go to Vietnam, uh, and there are those you know, who are working in the fields in Vietnam, uh, very manual labor. And the interesting thing is that if you are in a rural area, you're a farmer, uh, that is your life. Uh, almost all of that poor, you penny people, uh, you're farmers. Uh, and you go and talk to uh, someone who's been in the village for a long time, like we did with this, this uh, obvious grandfather. Uh, it's all he's known. It's all his children have known. It's all his grandchildren will know. Is this, and is there any possible way you, he can get out of it? The other thing which you then lead to is, OK, so you've grown it. Now what? You look at where it's stored. Vietnam is stored here. Actually, I didn't figure out how you guys actually got over there to get the food. Uh, in rural India, it's stored, again, on the road. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of waste involved, and there's a tremendous amount that could be done. And then you say, OK, it's been stored. How do you transport it? Well, you transport it, uh, this is actually in India, with a camel. They do it in Egypt, too. Uh, this guy must be going back. Uh, nothing on there. But uh, you can carry it in Vietnam. And this is my favorite photo. This is like one of the few times I took a photo. It was clear the guy I took a photo of was not happy I took a photo. Uh, uh, you can carry your crops. Now, the interesting thing here is that, first of all, he can't care very much. And the second thing is, once he's decided where to go, he's pretty much committed. And if the town on the east has better prices than town on the west, and you have no way to do commerce to find the best place to sell, and you pick the wrong one, you've lost. And so the growing, the storing, the transporting, uh, the care of it uh, is a tremendous opportunity. And I think now is probably one of the single biggest opportunities for innovation um, these days is agriculture around the world where the people are starving. Uh, and it's an economic opportunity. Sure, we'd like fewer people to starve, but we can be successful. People in the middle can be successful. And people can go less hungry. And they turn into marketplaces. Uh, this is actually in Turkey. Uh, and it's so much fun to go through. I have thousands of photos of marketplaces. Uh, and then, of course, there's the delivery of the bread. Uh, once it's been found, uh, you go to the delivery. Uh, there's none of this, you know, call up your uh, favorite store and have food delivered like you do now. Uh, they walk up and down the streets, uh, or ride their bicycles up and down the streets, uh, carrying uh, bread on their head. This is a picture I took by flipping the camera over my shoulder and taking a picture, uh, and it actually turned out well. Uh, this is in Egypt. Uh, again, 
Transportation, a huge opportunity here. Agriculture. Next one is health. Uh, health obviously has improved greatly around the world, but it is also a tremendous opportunity. Uh, if you go and look to see why most children die, the single largest reason why children die are upper respiratory diseases. Those are all treatable. Uh, the second one uh, has to do um, um, is malaria. Oh, it's treatable. Uh, people die from mumps, right? Uh, people die from diseases that we have all, many of which uh, we have had immunizations against for years, right? And so if you go to this little Indian town called Junachamu, uh, they have the records, all the immunization records of all their children uh, on walls of the health clinic. And that's uh, one wall, every single wall, and they actually, they believe it's important for all the children to be immunized. And so what they're doing, uh, this is a sarpanch, the mayor, it's kind of the mayor, city manager, uh, judge and everything uh, of this town. Uh, this is actually one of our first projects, which is called the India Rural PC, which is that little black thing right there, which is designed to work in 50 degrees centigrade, dust, uh, intermittent power, uh, virtually no connectivity. And uh, we actually provided to him to do those, those records, uh, sorry, to work with the government, that first instance. He decided, well, that's nice. That's why I said, go, go away, nice little intel people. Uh, and uh, he decided that his thing he wanted to do was improve the health of his village. And when we came back about six months later, later, he had every immunization record of every child in his village and the surrounding villages in there, knew which ones had missed it, what their schedules were, just like we all you know, go, run around with an immunization card. He uh, was going to make sure everyone in his village got immunized. And this is a great example of you can have all the great intentions, and the people you're working with will use it to what they want to accomplish. And the other interesting thing is after this conversation, uh, the mayor uh, and the guy whose arms are crossed, who turns out is a reporter, uh, all, the, all the reporters left, et cetera. Uh, and the reporter and the sarpanch, the mayor, and I went for a walk. And I went to the reporter and said, OK, put your camera away. You're now a translator. And we walked around with the mayor, the sarpanch, and I said, I'd like to see, meet the youngest person, the oldest person, the school, the health clinic, which is actually where we went to the health clinic, and your best business. And as we were walking through town, I asked the reporter to ask the mayor, where do you see your village in five years? Because to me, it's a great thing to ask people their future. And five years is far enough away to future, but it's not so far away that it's forever. And usually when I ask, these people, uh, ask people a question, they think about it, and they give either no answer or some answer, or they didn't think about it, or the answer they think I want to hear. The mayor, without a pause, replied. He said, in five years, I want all the roads to be paved. I want every house to have clean drinking water. I want all the children to be educated. And I want to have connectivity to the outside world so we can do business. And he walked on. And I said to the reporter, come back. This guy has his act together. Uh, and the reporter, a few months later, sent me an email and said, you were right, and we're actually doing a story on them to showcase to others uh, how it can be done uh, using innovation, not just technology. OK, this is officially the only picture in this presentation that I haven't taken. Uh, and this is because. This is in Uganda. Actually, it's one of two pictures I haven't taken. Uh, this is the displaced person's camp, and it's pretty well hopeless uh, there. Uh, it's hopeless because they cannot contact their family. They cannot do commerce. They cannot educate their kids. Uh, it's just pretty hopeless. However, uh, in Vineo, which is a place that I'm a board member of, they do projects that do connectivity in the furthest of furthest, the harshest of harshest, the places that I have to tell you, I wouldn't go. Uh, but they will go and climb tall towers. Uh, and this is a project to provide connectivity uh, to this displaced person camp near Kampala in order to be able to improve the lives of those people there. Uh, and this is inside the kiosk. And again, people use it for connectivity. They use it for communication. They use it to improve their lives. Uh, they use it to be able to no longer feel isolated. And again, it's a very simple thing. Uh, with a very simple bit of technology, 
It's an innovation, nothing tremendously magical, but it's something that's to be done. And as I mentioned, if you want to do this, you have to climb tall towers. Uh, this is not a very tall one. Uh, James Weary he climbed a 160 meter tower. Uh, it's not in this picture. Um, the other thing is commerce. There are many people in the world, if they just had $10 more, $25 more, they could be more successful. And this whole concept of microfinance, microcommerce, micro that could be done. And as we know, Muhammad Yunus uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize for this. There are a lot of people around the world who are really focusing on it in the US, including actually one of the larger ones is, is located here in Davis. And the lady who sold food by the side of the road, by the way, this is a butcher in Egypt. Uh, for those of you who want to run out and get some meat, this is where you go in Egypt, the butcher. He could use more money and maybe get a place he wouldn't have to do on his cart. Uh, this is someone selling fruit by the side of the road in Vietnam. Again, there are a lot of concepts of small businesses that with a little more money, they could be more successful. Then this is concept of communication. Uh, this is the United Nations. Uh, what a great place to be. Uh, I can't remember, but the guy in South Africa, he was just screaming about something. So it made such a great photo. But it's not just those people communicating that's important. It's everybody important. Uh, this guy in, in, uh, in um, Cairo, uh, he obviously has something to say. Uh, and it wasn't at me, luckily. But it's not just men, it's women. Uh, in many places in the world, women are underrepresented and understated. And one of the ladies in my class is actually doing a project on getting better representation of women in governments around the world. And I said, the US is off the table for this conversation. And she is actually proposing that women represent other women better. And if women are represented better, your economy of your country will be better. Special case. People want to be heard. People need to be heard. And with innovations, it can happen. And obviously, uh, children as well. Uh, children being able to communicate with each other, be able to speak, will improve their, their livelihood and their possibilities. And then there's our favorite topic, which I was wrong by picking first, water. Uh, about 40% of the world's population does not have tr safe drinking water. And it's actually one of the leading causes of disease. Now, you don't die from drinking dirty water. You die of something else, or you're sick for something else, or you have low birth weight, or, 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 or. Uh, and the concept of being able to provide safe drinking water in Vietnam, uh, in Egypt, uh, I'll spare you my thousands of photos of people carrying water. Uh, it has become such a precious commodity. People can spend all day carrying water. And if you can purify it, if you can store it, if you can keep it uh, safe, it does two things. Number one, it reduces diseases. And number two, it allows people to have more time to do other productive work, uh, which will improve their economy. And then, of course, in rural India, they actually had a, a pump, uh, which was a great place to do it. Another one which I have to say, one of the great things about teaching here is I've learned from the students. And I've learned from our students that actually biomass, I learned that term, actually is a problem. And of course, I searched through my thousands of photos and found some biomass photos. Uh, these are women in Guatemala and children carrying firewood. Uh, in China, I have pictures of people who have stacks of firewood larger than their house to keep their house warm for the winter. And in rural India, this is how you cook. Uh, and about 2 million people every year die from indoor pollution. It's from cooking inside. Uh, and the ability to be able to do an innovation, whether it be solar cooking water, whether it be vents, uh, whether it be any sort of cooking innovation, could dramatically improve this. And they're all very simple innovations that can be done um, around the world. Last but not least is education. Uh, we all know about education. Uh, and education is, in many ways, our future. It's the future of Davis, it's the future of California, it's the future of the world. Uh, and again, you ask any principal in the developing world, uh, the first sentence will be broken families is my biggest problem. Uh, their second sentence will be not enough well-qualified teachers is the second biggest problem. You'll find schools with no teachers. You'll find uh, schools uh, without qualified teachers. Again, the US is off the table for this conversation. But you can see that that is keeping children 
away from where they want to be. And kids actually want to come be educated. Uh, it's interesting about fences. Fences uh, in Latin America are around schools to keep people out. Fences are around schools in the Middle East to keep people in. And this kid obviously wants to get educated. And these children who are in rural Vietnam obviously want to do, do it as well. It's a huge opportunity. Uh, and the interesting thing is that children look to their parents and others uh, to help them do that. They are clearly not old enough to be able to figure out themselves. And so um, uh, Dean Bigger introduced, so the last project that I did at Intel actually was this Intel Power Classmate PC that actually you showed great self-restraint by not picking up. Um, and this is one of the things that we did, uh, one of our last projects. Uh, here, I'll pass around, but not to the family and friends table, because you all have seen it probably too many times. Uh, and one of the things that we did to solve uh, two basic problems, uh, one basic problem, uh, not enough well-qualified teachers. Personalized device, um, uh, as you all know, Nicholas Negroponte developed the one laptop per child. We did it at the same time. Uh, they're both, uh, uh, they are uh, competing products as well as products that support each other. And it's just an example of things that you can do, we all can do, to be able to solve problems in the developing world. Uh, so this is in Nigeria. Uh, this is in Brazil. Um, this is in Uruguay. Um, and uh, this is in Peru, where children are being able to do what we, uh, we believe, uh, which right now they're running tests and sales, something that we believed in uh, to make a difference to the developing world. So the amazing, I've had a great opportunity here to be able to join UC Davis. Thank you to all of you. And that I thought I would share with you is the students who have the courage uh, to stick in with me on this. Uh, most of you will notice, many of you will notice the great picture where this is taken. This is taken at One Capital Mall, one of those other UC Davis Graduate School of Management cam campuses. You'll notice UC Davis can't sign in the background. Uh, and Min, who's one of my students, actually is in the photo there. Uh, and this is um, a set of people who have decided to stick in with me. And, and you also notice by the clock, we go late every night. Uh, it's five after nine. Uh, and to be able to share their passion and share their knowledge uh, and be able to learn uh, from me, from each other, as well as teach each other and teach me. And the very first night I came in and said, I want everybody to bring one sentence of something you want to improve in the developing world, not binding. We had a great conversation. The next class, we said, I said, everybody come in with a three by five card of three facts of something you're interested in, in the developing world. Again, it's not binding, but we're getting close. And then week three, which was the most, past, most recent week, I said, OK, everybody come in with a poster. Think of this as sixth grade. Come in with a poster of the data of what you're interested in and what your problem is. No PowerPoint. And also the obligatory three-page written report. Uh, and we went over all those. And I have to tell you, the ideas that they came up with, the ideas that they want to go through. Actually, I learned a lot by reading the papers today and grading them. Uh, and I learned a lot, as did everybody else from the posters. There is real opportunity here from the students here and from all of you to actually learn and make a difference. And what really makes me excited to come to work once a week uh, is that ability to be able to share and to learn. And I think, I know we'll make a difference. Uh, there are several of the working professionals who work at companies who do water or drugs, um, or um, obviously one, um, one person works uh, in a hospital, um, and be able to carry that to the businesses that they run. And so I want to leave you with one last slide. Uh, I firmly believe that, unless there's some magical photos, which there were two in this presentation, uh, that you should take every photo that you present. And this photo is in a very rural uh, Uruguay. Uh, it's called the interior. And I took this photo as I left school and got in the car, and I didn't realize its power until the darkroom, AKA my PC later. Um, this little girl is on the other side of the fence. And the fence is what's separating her from me, her from her future, uh, and her from the possibilities. And I think it represents 
uh, one of the great opportunities we have to be able to really understand the developing world, be able to come up with ideas, and to be able, in a very practical manner, go implement those ideas. And it can be successful for us, and be successful for the companies we work with, be successful with the universities that we are in, are part of, or were part of, or could be part of. Uh, and clearly, it's also economic success for everybody along the way, uh, and for those in the intended uh, use, which is this child here. So, thank you very much for joining me on in innovation. <laughs> Will will take some questions, but uh, Becky would like you to speak into the microphone. Or I could future questions. No questions. Yes. Since everyone's shy, I'll ask. What what I've been seeing uh, over the past few years is new business models that start to address all of these kinds of issues that you've provided us with digital images. And, and I think that's really where the business world is starting to go. The, the idea of one blockbuster drug, product, or whatever out there. Uh, and we're starting to see that, that we can really have some impacts if we get out of those old business models and start to uh, apply some new ways of thinking to solve some of these problems. So with your travels, I mean, it's one thing to dream up a solution to someone, but to make a business model that's, that can be applied to all these different uh, cultures and places around the world I think is essential for us to be successful rather than running around the world and littering it with our old solutions. So that's a little more of a statement, but I'd like to, I'd like to explore those business models out there also. So you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not just technology, uh, it's the business models. If you look at the kiosk, the reason why the kiosk is successful is because they make this 10 and 20 rupees for every little sale and it's not an individual using a computer, it's someone as their job. So there was a business model that was developed there. Uh, business models um, for major companies in the US or elsewhere, uh, I completely agree. Uh, there's a recent story about, we would actually call them Danon, Danon Yogurt, but they actually call themselves Danone. Uh, and they recently uh, did a joint venture with uh, Eunice on the Grameen family to provide uh, yogurt uh, in Bangladesh, they originally targeted uh, teens. And they changed their entire business model. It's not like you run to your favorite grocery store here. They changed their entire business model uh, and they're being wildly successful. And so there's a couple things which I think I have learned and I would agree with you completely. Uh, first of all, we have to be open to change our business model. Uh, second of all, we have to be open to change our, our um, profit expectations. Um, sorry? You only have two cents, exactly. Uh, and we need to be able to change uh, and be able to listen more. And I 100% agree with you. Some of the things that we've done uh, have been success there. And I have to admit, some of those, luckily not in the picture, uh, but some of those littering around the world actually I've done. And we've actually learned from that. But I 100% agree that we and everybody in between needs to be willing to change their business models for this to be a success. It's not just an innovation. Well, thank you again for, for being here tonight and also teaching for us. Uh, I, I have a question for you about your experience. So you've ta and I'm sure the economic component is, is part of the solution there, but could you talk a little to potential resistance that Intel faced going into these markets from government and public policy in those local markets? On camera and everything. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know if we have enough time for all that. But uh, there, if you look at overall, the resistance to go do an innovative product or an innovative business model uh, in 
the developing world runs across a number of things. First of all, within your own company, you have an established business model, an established sales model, established sense of profitability, profitability, and you have to be able to work around and through all those things, and that's probably the hardest thing to do. The second thing is, in the countries, there are a lot of, obviously a lot of politics. And an example that I will use is that uh, the former President Fox of Mexico promised 400,000 low-cost PCs to teachers. And we actually developed one for him. And the key words are the former President Fox. And the other key word is the Teachers Union of Mexico. And I think in that time period, I think Intel sold exactly none uh, of that product there. And so there is working through the local uh, political agenda. There is also, in many ways, local social mores uh, and a lot of uh, local village politics of what they're trying to accomplish. Although in many ways, I think just like we would see in local governments in the US, they see um, the uh, possibility for their government much more straightforwardly and they're much more easy to work through. The interesting things to actually work through is, I uh, forget the exact term, but there's a term for uh, a government based on corruption. Uh, what's the word for that? Klepto something or other, right? Thank you. I figure with the room of econ people, we should know that. Uh, and uh, so government's based on corruption. And I think one of the very valuable lessons I got there in working through these innovations is that uh, a lot of product, pretty much all the product that we had at one time, was smuggled into China. And uh, the, I asked the gentleman I was with, I said, OK, so the import duties is 17%. How much does it cost to smuggle product into China? Very, you know, this pragmatic business person that I am. He said, oh, it costs about 8 or 9% uh, to smuggle product into China. Uh, and I said, oh, this sounds like a really simple problem. You lower the import duties to like 12%. You raise the, the uh, enforcement at the border, and it's all good. Nothing more gets smuggled in. And this was the first time that I got what I later learned to call the, oh, you naive North Americaner look. <laughs> and I got the look, and I, I, I named the look later. Uh, but I knew exactly what it meant. And I looked and said, oh, I get it. The government officials are the ones who are getting that 8 or 9%. He said, exactly, right? So, uh, and I've gotten that naive North American look lots of other times around the world in other stories. So, uh, it is difficult. I think the things that we have found um, in this, you know, project or any other project that you read about is making sure that you open the Dale Carnegie book and turn to the page that says, you know, how was this in their interest? And if you look and work through why is it in the government's interest why is it in the superintendent of schools' interest? Why is it in the president's interest? And you can work through why it's in everybody's interest. You can be very successful. And you have to, there's two things that it does. Number one, you have to be able to craft this story to sell it. And number two, you have to be certain in yourself and your value proposition to be able to craft that story. Why is it in everybody's interest? And in those times, uh, that is in everybody's interest um, are the ones who are successful. Now, the thing which we were successful in ways that I would have never expected, uh, and by the way, one of the things I tell the students, you have to be ready to be successful in ways you never expected, uh, is the people who are uh, very affluent, the very rich people. So the ideal very affluent person was born and raised in the country, became very rich there, moved to the US, is really rich here, and has grandchildren. Ideal rich person, right? and they want to do something for their country. Uh, so uh, the guy who is, the, I would call, the richest not-in-jail person in Russia uh, uh, has decided to give millions of computers to the, poor, to the uh, orphans in Russia, because he's an orphan. Uh, and our favorite, Carlos Slim, he's decided to give a lot of computers uh, to poor uh, in Mexico. Uh, and actually, one of the things that I've actually discovered is there are a lot of very well-meaning people uh, who would really like to help the developing world, and if you are Carlos Slim um, or you know, a very affluent person in Russia, you can figure it out. Uh, but for many others, 
uh, they need help figuring it out. So I think a, a big opportunity for us and for others uh, is to find ways with a good business model, with a good product, uh, and approach those who are more affluent than we are. Uh, and if they hit the ideal model, it's even better uh, to be able to go do that. So, you know, those are one of the things actually we never discovered and actually have actually created some of the best successes. I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to uh, have you help me thank uh, Will for sharing his passion with us and hopefully inflaming some uh, passion uh, uh, inside us uh, here, too. I have a little something for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I also want to. I want to um, uh, invite you to have dessert. Uh, so please uh, stay around and talk with us and uh, enjoy some, uh, some little bites. Thank you. Thank you very much.